It looks like I'm responsible to keep time, so let me get myself set up. And I do have my badge. It says speaker, and I'm here so you know that's what my badge says. I'm going to put it down so it won't be a distraction for me as I speak. It is truly a privilege to be among you this weekend and to share in the ministry of God's Word as we have enjoyed good things of the Lord together with one another, as the Lord has been ministering to our hearts graciously. At a conference like this, with uh, so many sessions and so many of God's esteemed servants ministering from God's Word, you hear a lot of things. You hear a lot of good things. And sometimes it can become pretty overwhelming as to what to do with all the good things that I'm hearing. All the things that challenge my heart, engage my mind, stir my emotions. And I think it is a, a wise thing to discern what that one or two things may be that God particularly exercises your heart and then pray that God would give you the grace to be a good steward of the things that you have heard. So you go back to your homes, the places of your work, the places of your learning, the places where you engage life as a Christian believer, that those things that God impressed you with, among all the many things that you heard, that you will seek the help of God to be a good steward of it. Uh, the topic that uh, has been assigned to me for consideration with you this evening is the declaration of God. Again, considering it in the context of the passages that we've been looking at, particularly in uh, Genesis chapter 6. We've been around chapter 6 of Genesis a number of times, and maybe in preparation for the conference, you've already been reading it. As I ask you to turn with me again to the book of Genesis and chapter 6, uh, I'm reminded of a Presbyterian preacher in Scotland who did an exposition of uh, chapter 7 of Romans, and he was going at it word by word and verse by verse. And after several months of uh, going through Romans 7, one of the members of the congregation approached the minister and said, these things have all been very good. Are we ever going to get out of Romans 7 and get to Romans 8? And he paused and he said, we'll never get out of Romans 7 as long as I'm your minister. So you may wonder if we will ever get out of Genesis 6 before the weekend is over. Well, uh, let us read a couple of verses in Genesis 6, and I want to go to the New Testament uh, for a few verses as well. Genesis chapter 6, and verse 6 reads, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made man. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. 
and verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. And now to the New Testament, to the Gospel according to Luke. Luke's Gospel in chapter 17, which is almost a parallel passage to the passage in Matthew, from which the theme verse have been announced to you. Luke 17 and verse 20. And when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. We will trust the Lord will add his own blessing to the public reading of his word and give us help and understanding as we look into it together this evening. In the 1970s and 80s, if you lived back then, and if you watched TV, you will have been exposed to a commercial that will come on. It is a commercial in which you will find some very uppity kind of people, the, the, the yuppies of the day, gathered in some social gathering, and they are all well adorned, and they are all talking about one thing or another, and it's a quite a noisy affair. And in the midst of all that clamor, uh, one person talks to another about E.F. Hutton. And the line goes, and as soon as they say E.F. Hutton, the entire clamor stops. Everybody is in total attention. So much so that if a pin dropped, you could hear it. And then comes the punchline. When E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. When we sit with the open book, the word of God, in a gathering like this, I do not think it will be necessary for me to argue the point that God speaks, and that God speaks in his word. That God speaks in his word as he speaks nowhere else. That God's word is inspired, that it is inerrant, that it is authoritative, and that it is reliable. God speaks, and God speaks in his word. The question to ask is, if God speaks in the word of God as we believe he does, is anybody listening?
In the book of Hebrews, we are told that there is a dead man whose faith is presented as an example. And then it says, Enoch, uh, not Enoch, Abel this is, that although he is dead, he still speaks. Now if a dead man spoke, CNN and ABC and NBC and all other C's around and Fox and you name it, they'll all be covering it 24 hours a day, won't it? Bible-believing Christians, we, we believe that God speaks in his word and he was to convey his mind and his truth to those who want to pay any attention at all. Does it really impress us that God, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, who made everything that there is by his word and now sustains everything by his word, wants to communicate to us his word. And I trust this evening that God will find us a people eager and wanting to hear. Because if you really think about the days of Noah and the people who lived then, the fundamental problem was that they did not want to hear or heed the word of God. And the distinguishing feature about Noah was that he both heard and heeded the word of God. He believed that God has spoken and he believed that what God has spoken is a reliable word. May God find us this evening and through the course of this weekend not as defiant and rebellious hearers. God through the prophet Isaiah once said, On this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Oh, brother, sister, has it been your singular experience as you sit before the open book and hear the word of God as you read it and as you meditate upon it, as you hear it expounded, that God is indeed speaking and that he finds me with a contrite spirit before the word and one trembling at his word. Paul, writing to, Thess to the Thessalonians, observed this, that when you heard the word preached to you, you received it. How? You received it as the word of God and not as the word of man. And the evidence, the evidence that you received it as the word of God and not the word of man is that this received word you welcomed. You welcomed in such a way as though you were expecting the word to come. You know, you, you have that happen sometimes, you know, you're just sitting down for dinner after a long day and the doorbell rings. And it is the local window salesman who tells you that he's been driving by and noticed that maybe you could use a new window or two. And you're not really eager to open the door and welcome him in and have a long conversation, are you? You're trying to close the door as quickly as you can so that you can get back to the dinner table before the stuff gets cold. 
But if you are actually expecting guests or family, and the doorbell rang maybe at two, three minutes before the expected arrival time, you would go in and you open the door wide, you invite the person or people in, and you have a long, hearty conversation. Why? Because you are expecting the person to come. Paul says to the Thessalonians, that's what you did with the word of God when it was preached to you. You received, you heard it not as the word of man, but you heard it as the word of God. You received it, you welcomed it, and the evidence of that is that it became an energizing thing in your life. Meaning, it began to impact your life. Does that do that for us? Have we had the wonder of hearing God speak and then finding ourselves, then, as our blessed Lord said, keeping that word? Keeping in the sense of retaining it. Not allowing things to come and crowd it out. But keeping it in the sense of also observing, practicing it. Because the highest form of self-deception is to be a hearer of the word. And only that So Noah was a good hearer of the word. He heard it. He received it. He had that received word impact his life, his behavior, his actions. Genesis 6. The word of God has been instructing us through the last several sessions that there was something about the man that God created that displeased him because of wickedness. Not only the wicked acts that were manifest, but because of the wickedness of the heart that issued in the wicked acts. See, sometimes we mistakenly think that it is the evil deeds that we do that render us sinners before God. But scripture consistently teaches, whether it is in the Old Testament or the New, that we are sinners and therefore we sin. Rather than we sin and we become sinners. And sometimes it's a difficult thing to get our mind to really conceive that. That my external behavior, my manifest actions are simply an expression of the thoughts and the motivations and the inclinations of my heart. That it is who I am on the inside that do become evident and manifest in the things that I do. The fruit that the effects are, the deeds are, are actually coming from the root that is within. Every once in a while I have people sitting with me and uh, they will talk about one thing or another that they did that got them in trouble with their family or with the police or with their employer and uh, then they pause and then they quickly say, you know, I cannot believe I said that or I did that. Some even say, it was not me. Oh, really? 
pray tell who was it see when people say i cannot believe i said that or did that it could not have been me they are in a veiled way saying that i am i am beyond all that you know i can i can think of the i can think of the crook down the street doing things like that but me because man struggles to come to grips with the fact that the dilemma that he finds himself in is actually an inside job see we want to make problems that we participate in to be all coming from outside of us and we are victims of it i just got born into the wrong family or i am living in the wrong part of the country or uh, you name it it's it's all somehow external to me but the emphasis of scripture and uh, uh, you you can you can sample it anywhere you want we cannot get far from this recognition that the manifest problems really reflects the reality that it is not the problem that i have but it is the problem that i am i am a man a woman who is estranged from god by nature i am cut off from the very source of life and therefore i do the things that i do so god has a reaction to it earlier this morning we we were reminded of that very clearly so i'm not going to spend too much time on it that a holy just righteous god cannot embrace a sinful man with all of the ugliness of it and retain his own perfection and his own holiness so the early verses of chapter 6 complicated verses they and i'm going to leave it for keener theological minds than mine and more uh, more accomplished scholars to solve all the interpretive problems of what all was going on but if you read it with uh, any sense of attention you will discover that whatever was going on in verses 1 2 3 and 4 was not a good thing that what was going on was that there was a mixing of that which is of god and that which is of man and god was not pleased with the process and god was not pleased with the product because the product was something of which god and man had very different assessments man's assessment of the product of that process was that these were giants that we produced these were mighty men that we produced these were men of renown so well, that all looks like pretty good doesn't it the big they're strong they're famous and god's assessment of the product goes something like this it's evil it's wicked it's not good it is corrupt and god repeats these ideas over and over again and if man is ever going to get out of that mess one of the first requirements is that he needs to come to grips with the assessment that god gives it and be willing to confess it with him so if god says it is wicked and evil and corrupt man if he is ever going to get out of his mess would need to come to a place where he is willing to confess the same thing it is wicked it is evil it is corrupt 
And that's a real problem with our uh, society too, isn't it? We don't want to call things what God calls things. What God calls evil and sinful, we want to call it freedom. And, 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 and I don't want to give you a laundry list of all the things, but you know it, you are, you are thinking people. It was not long ago when a man went through some kind of uh, uh, sex change so that he became a she who he was a he before and then she became a he and uh, I think it was Time magazine that wanted to make now I don't know what pronoun to use that person the person of the year because of unusual courage and through God's great prophet Isaiah says you know it's a it's a corrupt society that would call Evil, good, and good, evil, darkness, light, and light, darkness, bitter, sweet, and sweet, bitter. You know, the, the name tags have all been changed. It's a clever strategy of the enemy, isn't it? South from us in Detroit is Canada. And that sounds kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? Because Canada is supposed to be north. But there is a little place called Windsor in Canada that's south of us in Detroit. And there's a good brother I know in one of the gatherings of the Lord's people there. And he told me once, uh, some decades ago, uh, some teenagers wanted to pull a little prank in one of the department stores. So they found a way to break in. And they, after the store people all left, they just walked around the store and they just changed price tags of items. They didn't steal anything. They didn't destroy anything. They just walked around and just changed price tags. So that a $1,000 Italian made suit was marked for $4.99. And a pair of socks, maybe $565. We laugh about it. But do we realize that this is the enemy's strategy throughout? Changing price tags around so that we get to a place where we know the price of things, but we don't know the value of anything. God reacts to the wickedness and the evil and the corruption. And God says, I'm going to destroy the whole thing. The God who was very pleased with creation originally, so that he couldn't stop telling, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is very good. Now, says it repents me. I am grieved because it is not good. I will destroy. Now we are really entering into what uh, uh, theologians and uh, scripture itself would uh, refer to as the question of the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God, and the verse was quoted several times already from Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And for us that's a very uncomfortable kind of a doctrine, isn't it? The wrath of God. We would much rather think and sing and talk and preach about the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Some of us regrettably become even embarrassed to talk about the wrath of God in public. 
It's almost like uh, some kind of a nasty family secret, you know, about, about the dear, dear dad who is overall a pretty nice man, except, you know, he, he has these flares of temper. And, you know, he flings a few plates and breaks a few dishes and puts a few holes in the wall and uh, just, just flies off the handle a little bit. But once, once he kind of blows, it, it blows over, then he's a very fine chap, you know, good little man, our dad. So we think God's wrath, when scripture talks about it, it is talking about somehow God getting into a bad mood. And just flying off the handle. Or having a temper tantrum of sort. But the wrath of God. Is an expression. Of the perfection of God. The wrath of God is God's continuous. Consistent. Settled reaction to sin and evil. Consistent with his character and consistent with his holiness. It is an aspect of the very splendor of his mercy. So my dear brothers and sisters, may I encourage you, if you haven't done it lately, find some time and a quiet place and delight yourself in meditating upon the wrath of God. And the just judgment of God. So you are probably sitting and wondering, you know, no one lived so long ago. A true antediluvian, as he is sometimes referred to, pre-flood. So literally... And figuratively, he's an old man. He, he lived so long ago, Facebook wasn't around, Instagram wasn't around, and Twitter wasn't around. None of these things that we are familiar with was around. What can we even benefit from thinking about a man like Noah? Well, and besides... When he was doing whatever he was, he was doing, nobody even believed him. So what is the point? Well, that is exactly the point. Nobody believed him then. Nobody almost believes he existed now. And the things about which he warned was a judgment to come. And, uh, you know, around here we would say, well, not many people think or believe that anything like a judgment is coming. So why bother? If for no other reason, this should be good enough for us because Jesus said something about Noah. And he said it with a great deal of uh, emphasis. And we better listen. So the Lord Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it is going to be in the days of the Son of Man. Now you will have noticed when we read it from Luke 17 that Jesus made reference to the days of Noah in the context of the Pharisees asking him about the kingdom coming. And the King James uh, would translate the word ask in such a way that it conveys the idea that they were asking in a demanding sort of way. It was not asking for information per se. He was, they, were, they were asking him this to really trip him up, which they have done quite often. So here they ask, what is it going to be like when the kingdom comes? How do we know? So the Lord Jesus responds and he talks about two aspects of the kingdom. One is the kingdom come already. And the other is the kingdom that is coming yet. The kingdom come, he says. When people run around and tell you look here or look there, don't bother because the kingdom come is such 
that it is not open for observation. It's not like you can look for visible data on which you can establish, oh yeah, because of that. And then he said, that aspect of the kingdom, it's actually in the midst of you. The king is present. Now, some translations have it is within you, like in your soul, but I, I don't think it can be the meaning because these Pharisees certainly did not have that kingdom within their souls. More accurately, we would understand it to mean that the kingdom is within you. It's among you. The king is here. You can get in on the kingdom. And then he goes on to talk about it again in verse 23. They shall say to you, he here or there. I don't believe that either because that is talking about the kingdom that is coming. When at the end, the kingdom comes in power and in great glory, there will not be the need for anyone to tell you, look here or look there, because it will be unmistakably noticeable. But what to do, how to behave, how to conduct ourselves, how to manage our lives and our days between kingdom come. When Jesus came, the last days having been inaugurated with that coming, and when the kingdom comes in power and in great glory, because the Lord Jesus is saying that as history draws to its end, as God directs the affairs of history to the conclusion that he has in mind, the men and women of that time will behave just like the men and women in the days of Noah. And have you noticed, and if you have not, please notice it now, that what he is paying particular attention to or focusing it on is not the ripening of evil as much as something else. The ripening of evil like it cannot get any worse than this. Things are so bad. Now if you look back at uh, Genesis 6, you know that God's description of it was pretty grim. And things were pretty perilous. But our blessed Lord, in exhorting the disciples, is not really talking about the ripening of evil so that it cannot get any worse. But he's talking to them about the preoccupation of people as history draws to a close. What are they going to be preoccupied with? Not with horrific evil, not with lurid sins, but they are going to be preoccupied with marriage, giving in marriage, eating, drinking. So who hasn't participated in some of that? Since the conference began. Or last week. Or the last year. These are all activities that are sanctioned by God. Against which there is no command. The point that the Lord Jesus makes is... In that day when history, the bankrupt affairs of this world draw to its close, men and women will be simply preoccupied with the everyday life as though nothing is ever going to be any different. That we will be engaged in things that God has sanctioned, but do it with no reference to God. It's 
not new you can go home we won't take time to read it now but you can go and look at second peter where people were already starting to say then what is this bit about the lord coming back and all that that's all old wives tales because things have gone on like they have gone on since the days of our fathers it's a very cyclical view of history you know things just go around and uh, they go, they, they're going to keep going around and going around and going around and you you born and uh, uh, you you live for a while you get an education you marry a wife and you have a family and you you buy a house and you get a mortgage and then you refinance get a better mortgage you retire you die and then the whole thing goes on again and again and the lord jesus is warning we need to be careful the clock is relentlessly moving so i must also god in his word reminds us that he has a purpose for history he has a purpose for your life and for mine that he is moving things along to his intended purposes and ends and we are to engage in the activities of daily life of getting an education of giving our children an education of working of marrying of buying houses and and engaging in these transactions that are necessary in human life this side of heaven but brothers and sisters the encouragement and the exhortation to us is that we need to do it with the conscious godly reverential awareness that god is moving everything to its con- conclusion um if you would turn with me for a moment to the book of ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 Remember now thou creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say i have no pleasure in them if you go back and read chapter uh, chapter 11 we don't have time to do it it's talking about how people can and need to engage in these things enjoy the good things of life especially addressing the young ones but he also cautions them the preacher do it with the awareness that god will one day bring you to judgment for these things now when we think about these things we always uh, think of you know yeah yeah god should judge god, god should judge the wicked you know sooner the better but we don't consider the fact that we too will one day answer to him i'm not talking about being judged and being sent to hell god has appointed a man acts 17 god has appointed a time when that judgment will be executed that expresses the wrath of god you know in the book of revelation John is permitted to see some things that are absolutely literally out of this world. He is given to see some things that are and he is given to see some things that are to come. And part of what he is given to see is the judgment that's going to fall upon an evil world. 
And then there was this, almost like this commotion, where they are going back and who is, who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the book, the scroll, and lose it? Question is, who is worthy to execute judgment? And John begins to weep because none was found worthy. And then he's encouraged, don't, don't weep, John. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he is worthy. Relieved, I would think, John looks back. And I would think he looked back to see a lion. But when he looked, he saw a lamb. As though it had freshly been slain. He is the only one worthy to execute judgment. Because he is the lamb who bore my sins, paid the price. He is the judge who saw the evil around him and he wept. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, so you and I should refrain from judging. There is one worthy, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the lamb that was slain. Oh, let us be mindful, brothers and sisters, that we will one day give an account to him for our life, for the redeemed life that you and I have, precious, redeemed life. May we use it for the glory of God and the advancement of his interests in this world. Let us pray. Father, for your word we give thanks. We pray that you will drive it home to our hearts. Grant that by your grace, your word will remain in us and will bear fruit for the glory of your name. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.